When I got pregnant at 13, I just felt broken forever. I honestly felt like if I continue to look for the next anger high, I'm going to end up arrested. I'm going to end up in prison. I've gone through divorce. We, we think it's going to kill us. It didn't kill me to start over. It didn't kill me to hit ground zero. It didn't kill me to have to say, you know what, I messed up. This is my truth. And it all started with me just thinking, I, I've served enough time being bitter. I've served enough time being ashamed. I just want to be better. You have had to endure just tremendous public stigma and judgment for your teenage pregnancy. You've had to work through shame, battled with insecurities and low self-esteem, depression and a toxic relationship. And with all of that, you found yourself in one of your darkest moments. You said you realized you had a choice. Settle for being powerless or get back up, take your power back and evolve. So what are the things that are stripping us women of our power? Mm. One of the things that I believe is stripping women of their powers, the same thing that was stripping me, is that I wanted to do something powerful. I wanted to have a home. I wanted to have a marriage. Like I felt like if I do something outside of me, then then I would have power. If I maybe wrote a book, if I got the job, then I would be powerful. And I did not realize that power has to move in you before power can move outside of you. So instead of thinking about what can I accomplish that will make me feel powerful, what do I need? to look like in order to be someone who's powerful. Instead, I started asking myself, who do you need to become? So that powerful moves are just the organic byproduct of who you are. So power really is an inside job and not a doing, it's a becoming. Yeah, oh, all right, so I've got an amazing quote of yours. I tell myself that I was incapable of controlling this scenario, but that was never true. I just gave my fear of change more power than my fear of things staying the same. I could have saved the money, but I didn't want my lifestyle to change. I could have lost the weight, but I didn't want my diet to change. I could have said no to the functions, but I didn't want my circle to think differently of me. The fear of change is no longer allowed to hold you hostage. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I think it's important to say that many of us would not necessarily give ourselves the language of feeling powerless. We just think about all of the things we want to do but can't do. So I want to do this, but I can't do this. I want to do this, but for some reason I can't get it together. The disconnect between what you want to do and what you can't do is engaged with power. But we have to first focus on that can't mentality. So why can't you do it? And when we start to think about why can we can't do things, whether it's speaking up in a meeting or making it a huge lifestyle change, a part of the reason why we can't do it has a lot to do with the effect that it will have on the people outside of us, how it may change the way they see us, how it may change our rhythms and our patterns. And so we end up staying stagnant and the same because we are afraid of what change can really do in our lives. And that is what keeps us from being powerful. It's not necessarily that we can't actually do it. It's just that that fear of change has more power than the actual doing required to manifest some of those desires that we have. And so I love this concept of power moving because if I can see that fear has my power right now, all of the power I need to actually do something is being held hostage by my fears, by expectations, by the way people have seen me. I can move that power that it's holding hostage and use it to then become some of those things that are on my bucket list, some of those things that I believe will bring me to my highest potential. And so we got to move that power from fear, from shame, from expectations and feel it in our soul in a way that empowers us to make the changes and decisions that allow us to live the life that we want to live. The problem that most of us have is that we have normalized fear, insecurity, doubt. We don't recognize it as the powerful force that it is. We just normalize it. Everyone's got fears. Everyone's got insecurities. My mother had this insecurity. My friends have these same insecurities. And when we normalize mm. our fears, our shame, our experiences that are negative, we diminish its power. And when we begin to see that, no, that thing is powerful, like this fear has mm. enough power to keep me from having the type of relationship that I want to have. This anxiety has enough power to keep me from breaking this generational curse. This um, you know, inability to speak up for myself has enough power to keep me from pursuing the career, the entrepreneurship. It 
has power. The first step is recognizing that your adversary, whatever is keeping you from moving into that desire, has power. The reason why we need to recognize that it has power is because we need to know this is a real opponent. And then we have to look at this opponent's strategy, right? If we ever watch these like war movies, mm -hmm. we'll see them trying to figure out what is their strategy. We see game players watching film. What is their strategy? How does it move? Then we get to see how does this fear show up in my life? How does the power of that fear, the power of that shame show up in my life? I don't speak up. Um, I'm afraid of being rejected. Really, in the day, like how many times did that power overpower who I wanted to be, overpower an opportunity for confidence? And then I start asking them like, well, what would you have done instead? If you weren't afraid, even if you don't actually do it, right? Because we're not always ready to be like, I'm going to stand up in the meeting <laughs> and give my speech, right? But what would you have done if you were not afraid if that fear did not have power over you, how would you have wanted to show up in that mm. moment? I want you to identify what it is that you want so that you can begin to create an appetite for it. You gotta be hungry for who you wanna become. It just can't be a vision, it just can't be a plan. You have to begin to get hungry for it. And I want you to begin visualizing what it would have looked like for you to step into your power. What would it have felt like for you to walk away from and actually given them your idea and said what was on your heart and the more that you begin to create that appetite, it is harder and harder to resist in the moment, those moments where fear is trying to overpower you and you choose and said, you know what? I'm gonna take a chance on myself. I'm gonna take a chance on the power of my authenticity, the power of what I can contribute to show up in this moment and overpower that thing that has had power over me. Wow, God, I, I love that idea of you have to build your appetite for you it. You have to, yeah, you have to be hungry for who you want to become. And the way that we become hungry for it is we start to see it, right? There's this uh, a scripture, right, that says to write the vision and make it plain. Why do we write the vision? It, it's not just write the vision, but make it plain. You got to see clearly who it is you want to become. What does she look like? What does she talk like? What are her thoughts? Who are her friends? I have to see this clearly because when I see anything that contradicts it, I recognize that this is an opponent. This is opposition. This is a threat against my destiny. And so if I can see it clearly, then I can begin to become that person that I have seen in this vision. Oh, a threat against my destiny. I want yeah. everyone to put that on a post-it. That's so powerful because I love having words like that, so that when something happens, it triggers a thought that then empowers me to move forward. Yeah. Um, and so the idea of really creating that appetite so that when you see it, you know it's there. And then to the point of, that you were making is that if someone's then pushing back and they have expectations that don't actually feel right to you, yeah. or you end up finding yourself people pleasing and doing things that don't resonate, I think what you're talking about, right, is when you break it down, you do the work that you just explained, these moments then are highlighted and you don't get in perpetual motion of doing the things that other people want you to do yeah. instead of going inwards. There's a flag on the play, mm. right? Sometimes when we're trying to break out of people pleasing, or we're trying to break out of living up to other people's expectations, we're afraid that it's gonna damage their relationship. And so we allow them to believe that a lesser version of us exists. And then we shrink to become that lesser version of who we are. And we walk away frustrated because we didn't have the courage to say, I actually disagree with that, or I actually think there's a better way of doing it. And so we're inwardly frustrated. Everyone else is happy. And part of the way we begin to break out of that is to begin to really recognize that there I go again, flag on the play. There I go again, allowing people pleasing to control the moment, allowing expectations to keep me from moving in the direction of what I think would be best. And the more that there's a flag on the play, the more that you begin to think about intervention. I believe that this is an opportunity now more than ever for women to become serious about the patterns and routines mm -hmm. that we get stuck in. And the reason why we get stuck in them is because at some point in our life, it may have been true. These friendships did fit. This relationship mm -hmm. did work this way. But now I have changed. Life has changed. Responsibilities have changed. But this dynamic hasn't changed. And the greatest gift we can give anyone we are in relationship or partnership with is the gift of who we are now, even if that means abandoning who they once knew. And I want to help you introduce who you are now to those people who you want to continue to walk out life with. This isn't the kind of book that's like, burn every bridge mm -hmm. and burn your life down. I 
I don't believe that it always has to be that way, but you owe it to yourself and you owe it to them to constantly reintroduce who you are, what it is you need, what is no longer true, and to ask them in exchange for the same thing. So how did you do that yourself then? Because let's go back to the moment where you are finding yourself depressed, you can't get up metaphorically or you know even physically, and you've done such a beautiful job of putting these power moves in place so that you end up finding a guy who really freaking loves you for you, and you don't seem to then compromise who you are. So if you don't mind um, breaking those okay. moments down, of like, what are those things that were actually keeping you? So you said fear. I assume judgment. I mean, being young and getting pregnant, especially when your father is so well known, letting go of those judgments, letting go of those expectations, picking yourself back up and then identifying who you really are. Okay. Okay. That's a journey. (laughs) Uh, It started, there was one thought that changed my mind and it was in the middle of, I was in a toxic marriage at the time. And I didn't even necessarily know that I wanted the marriage to end as much as I knew that I wanted that version of who I was in the marriage to end. How did you identify that? I was tired of her. I was just tired of who I was. I was angry. I, and not just angry. Like, I enjoyed the anger. Like, <laughs> like I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the rage. I enjoyed, like, it made me feel like, who who wants to come fight me? Like, I was, it was fueling me because I believe it was the only thing that made me feel alive because I'd become so numb from depression, from shame, from anxiety, that anger was the only thing that made me come fully alive. And I just got tired of being angry or numb. Those were the only two options. I'm either hitting the roof angry or I'm so numb that I'm walking through life like a zombie. And I just felt like I served my time. I served my time. I don't want to keep paying for this mistake. I've seen this movie. I don't want to watch it again. And I honestly felt like if I continue to look for the next anger high, I'm going to end up in prison. I'm going to end up arrested. I may end up actually hurting myself or someone losing my children. And I wanted something different. And it wasn't necessarily that I wanted this. This actually came by by surprise for me. All I wanted was to be better than that. And I started following this idea of how can I make a better choice? Just one different choice. Like instead of hitting the roof, I'm gonna walk away. And those better choices ended up becoming the guiding light that I really believe unlocked the power that many people experience from me right now. Right now, most of the time people see me like I'm on stage or I'm speaking from the pulpit and they think that that is me and my power. That is really just the summation of my power. I believe that I'm in my most powerful form when no one is looking when I'm holding on to myself, when I'm searching for the better, when I have found contentment and joy. And it all started with me just thinking, I've served enough time being bitter. I've served enough time being ashamed. I just wanna be better. And here we are, (laughs) figuring out still, what does better look like? But I have to tell you, Lisa, it's not just now that I'm looking for how can I become better. I'm also embracing the idea that Better is not just what can I do next. Better is asking myself what would make you better in this moment. And sometimes that's rest. Sometimes it's stillness. Sometimes it's boxing. Sometimes it's preaching. Sometimes it's doing an interview. I've allowed my definition of better to expand. But at first it was just, I want to get out of this. Mm. Oh my God, there's so much there. How, as you're doing that work, right, where you're saying, I just want better, how do you, start to then believe that better is possible. Because going back to something you're saying about can't and want, yeah. um, in your book, you say that, that can't is way more powerful than the word want. Mm-hmm. And so you didn't get stuck in the, I want something better, oh, but I can't do that. How did you start to believe you can and then encourage yourself to take the actions to then prove to yourself that you can? I don't know that I believe that I could. I was trying, like I just, Mm. sometimes you don't do something because you know you can, you just do it because it's a better option than what I was doing before. 
So I would be lying if I told you that, like, I just knew I could do better. I'm just like, I've tried angry. <laughs> I've tried bitter. I've tried upset. I've tried ashamed. I'm going to try better. And let's see where that lands me. And then better was like, hey, girl, I've been waiting on you. And I was like, I'm going to try better again. I didn't know that I could. And I think if you're waiting to know that you can do better, mm -hmm. then you're never going to discover it. It's literally an attempt. It's what we call faith. Like I'm going to try this by faith and then mm -hmm. we're going to see what happens. And I keep walking by faith in that way, but I didn't know that it existed for myself, though I saw it in other people. And I would think to myself, well, she found better. You know what I mean? If this person mm -hmm. found better and that, yeah, maybe their circumstance was a little bit different, but they still found their version of better. Maybe what I need to figure out is what does my version of better look like? And that was an attempt. And that attempt gave me evidence that I could try it again. Mm -hmm. And so there's never been a time where the pursuit of I can do better than this has ever left me without any evidence. So how did you... Um maneuver and recognize that that relationship wasn't good for you in order for you to be able to build your power back? Well, it, I think the writing was on the wall for the relationship. There was just like no denying that it wasn't making either of us better. Mm. And so that was pretty evident. I think what I was most concerned about is could I have value outside of a relationship? At the time I was then, I had two children. I was a single mother. I was still in my twenties. And it just looked like at the end of the day, I don't know what life can look like after you go through this divorce. And am I going to be okay with that was the question I had to ask mm -hmm. myself. And I was. I, I left that relationship not even necessarily thinking about how am I going to get in another relationship with someone else as much as I was thinking about how can I maximize my relationship with myself and my relationship with my children. And I was really able to accomplish that. How do I heal? How do I just embrace? This is my truth. There's nothing I can do to change it. I think I was 21, 22 at the time. I've got two kids. I've gone through divorce. This is my life. If I don't find a way to embrace it, no one else will. I can't teach them to do it. I can't teach someone else to do it. And so I began that journey of embracing that for myself. I found love in it. I found joy in it. We did the Christmas pictures. I moved home with my parents. I saved up. I bought a house. I'm like, I, I can live this life and it not kill me. We, we think it's going to kill us. Like if I have to live on my own, if I have to start over, I think it's going to actually kill me. It didn't kill me to start over. It didn't kill me to hit ground zero. It didn't kill me to have to to say, you know what, I messed up, this is my truth. And from that place, it actually empowered me to own all of who I am, even the messy parts. And in owning all of who I am, I was so comfortable in my life that I just started writing and blogging. And I, the blog is ultimately how I ended up meeting my incredible husband who I've been married to for almost 10 years now. And I will tell you the scariest part of going from that space of being single with my two children and feeling empowered in my journey as a single mother was the fear of losing myself in even a healthy relationship. So we can say we want the healthy relationship all we want to, but then there's a reality of like, I fought to become me. It did not come easy. I cried for this. In some moments I bled for this. I worked my fingers to the bone to get here. And the fear of being in a healthy relationship, I'm not talking about repeating the same thing because some of us are like, miss me, I'll never do that again. But what do you do when someone who has all of the values that you've been praying for shows up in your life? The idea that I'm going to have to let myself go to lay hold of him was frightening for me. And what I recognized is that because I had chosen someone who knew all of who I was and understood that they weren't just getting this broken shell of a girl, but they were getting a woman, that he was not looking to control me, that it was really about partnership. He wanted me to bring the fullness of my power into the relationship. He didn't want me to shrink. He didn't want me to pretend and to hide and act like this demure girl that I wasn't. He wanted who I was. And I had to trust that who I was was enough in the context of a healthy relationship, especially coming off the heels of having been in a bad one. So how did you have that confidence that you wouldn't go back, that you wouldn't end up with somebody that was also toxic again? Um, and then how did you make sure that when you met your husband that 
um, saying all the things that you said, right, that he really respected you and for who you were and that you were the strong woman, that over time, it didn't dissipate because that's the problem is that sometimes, you know, you talk about people who are in abusive relationships. They're like, I didn't know at first. Yeah. They were charming. And obviously your husband's amazing and I've met him. Mm -hmm. But like there is that worry to some people where it's like, well, what happens in a year from now? How do I make sure that I don't lose myself? And what they do is they put up walls. Yeah. Because they're like, I know what it was like. I'm never going to go back there again. You seem wonderful, but I don't necessarily trust myself to know that when I recognize toxic behavior that I'm going to be able to walk away. Okay, so two things. Part of the reason why I knew I wasn't going back is because I wasn't trying to avoid dating a certain type of person. I was trying to avoid becoming who I was in that relationship. Mm. And I think a lot of times we repeat the same cycles because like, I'm not going to date this kind of person again. Like if it's got this, the X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to leave him alone. No, no, no. I don't want to become her, who I was again. I don't want to become her. She was afraid. She was insecure. She was angry. I don't want to become her again. And so I am not looking for the signs in a person. I'm looking for the signs in myself. You know, am I nervous? Am I uh, mm. acting irrationally? Am I getting angry all of the time? Because I want to maintain the person who I fought to become in any relationship I move into. Now, having said that, when I was in it, when I first started dating my husband now, uh, I will say even when we first got married, I was afraid of losing who I had become. The key word is I was afraid. So even though I'd gotten to a place of wholeness as a single woman, when I got married, I was afraid of losing her. And so now I was looking at everything he said, did or asked through the lens of I'm afraid of losing myself. So I got to make sure I stand mm -hmm. 10 toes down and don't allow myself to to give up too much of myself. And so we could not effectively become a great team because I was trying to make sure that I didn't give myself to him fully because I didn't want him to walk away with the part of me that I fought for. Mm -hmm. I had to trust that a relationship that has been rooted in love, kindness, wholeness, humility, communication could only work if I wasn't moving from a place of fear. And so again, mm -hmm. I have to ask myself, how would you show up in this marriage if you weren't afraid of it ending? How would you show up in this marriage if you weren't afraid of losing yourself? How would you receive this gift? How would you receive this love? And I became a different person. Maybe you go to bed at night just dismissing your dreams and saying, no, no, my life is just fine. But Mahomi, do you actually want to live a fine life? Or do you actually want to wake up every day with utter ferocity and go after that dream or that desire that you absolutely have and you deserve? I wrote the book that gives you the 11 lessons on how on earth you take action even when you don't feel good enough, even when you don't feel you have the confidence. Because I was stuck there, I know how you feel, but I also know how to get out. So go grab my book on paperback, Radical Confidence, that can literally teach you the blueprint that you need in order to snap out of that word just fine. You you deserve more and with this book you can go out and actually deliver on that step by step every single day even when that voice in your head is telling you're no good don't listen to it grab my book and every day take that one step closer towards that vision of the life that you want go to radicalconfidence.com right now and stop dismissing your life as just fine I begin to say I need a hug can you help me with this What's your opinion on this? And like that may sound like small potatoes, but for a girl who built her life on being independent, seeking someone else's opinion on something was real challenging. But that was my way of saying, I want to build a life with you that is not rooted in the fear of me losing myself, but is built on the wonder of who we can become if we decide to truly partner together. Mm -hmm. And I am proud to say that those walls came tumbling down, not without a fight, <laughs> <laughs> not without the rubble. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I love who I am in this marriage. And that's why this message is important to me. Because if we are afraid that where I experience power as a single mother is perhaps the only place I can experience power, then we will shun the very mm. things that we actually hope for. 
But if we believe that power moves, when I move to a new city, when I move into a new relationship, when I move into a new stage of life, maybe I no longer have the children, maybe the children are at school, I'm no longer lamenting the power I once had. I'm searching for what power looks for looks like in this new dimension. Mm-hmm. And I found the power of being an incredible wife. I think I'm an incredible wife. I think he thinks I'm an incredible <laughs> I wife. I think he thinks but so I found the power of marriage and partnership and the power of having been a single mother. And it taught me that power really does move. And I hope that I never stop looking for the ways that power can show up Mm -hmm. even as life is changing. I love the idea that there's power in so many different areas. Uh So you don't have to fear losing power in one area if you're able to go, okay, well, how do I be a powerful wife and a mother and a, you know, work colleague or business partner or whatever? Um, I love that because if one falls, it doesn't feel like your entire life crumbles. Yeah. So then I love that you, with your, with the power and the assessment of, okay, if I lose it over here, where can I build it somewhere else? Yeah. And then in the relationship where you even said like without some, you know, some, some, some rubble, what does the rubble actually look like? Because I think it's in the mess sometimes where the p- people can actually see, oh, this is just part of the process. Not that I'm bad, something's going wrong or anything like that. Man, I think that the rubble looked like pride, um, I think uh, we call it, I guess, stonewalling now. Mm -hmm. Like I would intentionally block him out. I would shut down. I wouldn't let him know what I was thinking. I would move without him like knowing how I was moving. Like I lived my life as an independent woman, even though I was married. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take into account the fact that my decisions affect him because I didn't want my decisions to be controlled by him. And so I missed out on, like there would be some times where I would make a decision and I didn't talk to him about it. And it was a good decision for what I had to work with, but he has a totally different perspective. And when he brought his perspective in, he's like, well, you know, you don't exactly have to do it that way. You could actually do it this way and it could get done faster. And then I had to be humble enough to tell him that was a better idea. (laughs) Oh, that was actually pretty brilliant. And I'm so glad that we're married because now I have access to this brilliance instead of seeing this brilliance as an opportunity to control or compete with the way that I am. And then I started noticing, like, he does this for me all the time. Like, he's always asking my thoughts. He's always asking my opinion. Like, he values what I bring to the table. I can show him that I value what he brings by the table by allowing him the intimacy of seeing how I think, the intimacy of seeing why I do the things the way that I do. And I believe that it helped us to fortify our marriage where we weren't just holding hands and cuddle buddies and watching the same movies, but we were actually back to back in this crazy world and really taking into account one another's experiences and vantage Mm. points. God, that's so powerful because especially if you've done the internal work and you're like, okay, I'm building myself. I was powerless. I'm never going to go back there. And then someone comes along and they've got a better idea than you. Like that could be threatening. (laughs) (laughs) It is threatening. And then I think because I dealt with so many insecurities about like feeling dumb, feeling Mm -hmm. stupid. A different idea is not just a different idea. A different idea makes my idea dumb in the way that my mind works. And so I have to separate the idea that this different idea didn't make my idea dumb. Sometimes maybe the idea was dumb, (laughs) but you know, to be able to say that like, just because I had this thought doesn't mean that this is a reflection of my worth or my value. So creating space where someone can offer a perspective that doesn't demean my value and Mm -hmm. worth took unbelievable work. I mean, we're almost 10 years married. I'm probably just now about to get like my GED in this program. (laughs) And then you're going to go for your master's. (laughs) Right. And then I'm going to have to go for my master's because it just, it took a lot of work and being willing though, to do that work, to acknowledge it and to acknowledge the negative impact it was having on my relationship Mm -hmm. helped me to get serious about it. Cause I realized like, I am going to jack this thing up if I don't take it seriously. Yeah. And I think that when someone that you trust can be that voice next to you to kind of shine a light on either your great idea or your terrible yeah, idea yeah, yeah. actually is a helpful mechanism. And I'm always thinking the phrase I you'd like to use, especially when I get triggered, like I have the same thing, like I feel dumb mm-hmm. and I look at my husband like he's so freaking smart. And so I have really battled with that over the years because I'm mildly dyslexic, I've got ADHD. Yeah. And so I've got that internal voice that you're no good, Lisa, you're dumb, you don't know things. But now, 
I don't, I'm not insecure around my husband. When he points something out, I was like, thank you. You just made me more powerful yeah. because I was about to do something where I had blinders on and I didn't see the truth. So when you can trust that person to be able to give you that feedback, actually it can make you stronger um, versus actually bring you down. And you use the words competition. Yeah. That's one thing that you talk about in your book that is something that really holds so many of us back. And I think a lot of women specifically when it comes to competition, whether it's a status thing, a married thing, a looks thing, um, how do you overcome competition so that it doesn't strip you of your power? Mm. You can't overcome competition unless you are willing to admit that it's rooted in comparison. And once we acknowledge that it is rooted in comparison, we have to understand why we want to build esteem or confidence that is contingent on someone else failing or someone else being less than. And are we really comfortable with a confidence or esteem that requires for us to be the best person in the room? Are we really comfortable with that? I want to be the kind of person who can honor the value that everyone brings into a room without thinking that I don't bring any value into the room. Mm. So it comes back to like, who do you want to be? Like you want to be the best, sure. But does that mean that everyone has to be the worst in order for you to be the best? Or is there space for everyone to bring their best? And if you truly believe that there's space for everyone to bring their best, then we're not in competition. I'm your student. Like, I want to see how you build a set. I want to see how you conduct an interview. I don't want to walk away from this thinking like, man, I'll never be able to do what Lisa does. I want to walk away from this thinking I just became better because I was in Lisa's presence. Mm -hmm. And when we see everyone not as competition, but as a teacher, I think it better postures us to be in relationship with people in a way that's healthy for them and healthy for our confidence. And I know this because as a teen mom, I started looking for any and everything that would make me not as bad as someone. Or they may not be a teen mom, but they did drop out of school. Or maybe they didn't drop out of school, but their marriage didn't work. And so I started feeling better because someone else was being bad or someone else did something wrong. And I just realized that that meant that I had to look for their poison all of the time. And I was just constantly ingesting negativity. And I could never pull out of that poison or out of my own poison if I was constantly seeking more. And so in honoring others, I found a way to also honor myself. And as a result of that, I believe that when I am in relationship with people that I hope that one of the things they feel more than anything is honor, love, and gratitude for what they bring into the room, what they bring into our dynamic. And I believe that that is the best way to eliminate the spirit of competition, to recognize that it's a disease that started with something that had nothing to do with whoever's on the other side and has everything to do with what's happening inside of you. If you can get it out of you, then you can bring a better version of yourself into the world and hopefully teach other people how to do the same. Oh, that hits so many like real nerves there. Cause mm. I was thinking about growing up, I was very insecure and I did that. I was oh, like yeah. looking at everyone's failures to make myself feel better. Yeah, well, she got six toes. <laughs> <laughs> she don't have a baby, but she got six toes, okay. <laughs> she didn't drop out of school, but she got a pimple. Okay, so like, so maybe I'm not that day. Right. <laughs> And it just like I have to tear people down in order to feel better about myself. And I was still down. Mm -hmm. Like for all of that tearing someone down, here I am still on ground zero. And I couldn't lift myself up as long as I needed to pull other people down. Mm -hmm. And so being able to honor them and to admire things in them and to tell them about it, right? No secret admirer over here. Like, girl, if you're killing it, I want you to know you're killing yeah. it. And now I feel good that you know that someone saw you out here winning and there's something powerful about us connecting over the ways that we're showing up in the world with growth and positivity that changes everything. Anytime I have a Woman Evolve event, like there's a moment where I'm like, turn to the woman beside you, tell her she's killing it. Tell her her hair looks good, tell her, her shoes look good, ask her where she's going after this. Honor this woman beside you because when she leaves out of this place, we don't know how the world's gonna try and tear her down, especially as women of color. There are so many things that attempt to tear this woman down, but right now in this room, she is in the presence of another woman who understands what it's like to have an imperfect past, a perfect God, and a hunger for more. And there is no other place where she can be where someone can say, I see you, I love you, 
you got this, go kill it. That's what I want for every woman who I encounter. And those are the types of spaces that I love to create. That's so beautiful. And what, it's interesting because it literally is just a flipping perspective. Yeah. Like that is it. This woman isn't your competition. She's a sign that it can be done. Yeah. And so once you realize, oh my God, you're the you're the proof. You're the proof that it can be done. I can get motivated now. Oh yeah. And growing up in a world where we, women were the enemy, I was bullied and teased by girls. Yeah. It wasn't by guys. So as I was growing older, I definitely learned the wrong lesson of like, oh, protect yourself. Don't let a woman, you know, kind of like get close to you because then they could be a threat and that just kept me at, at arm's length with everybody and to your point if you can flip it and say how is this person a teacher I think it can break through imposter syndrome you know who am I to be in this room or instead of asking yourself who am I to be in this room look and be like oh my god look at what I can learn by being in this room for sure um and so that's flipping perspective for you was it the fact that you just realized it wasn't serving you and you realized that it was actually doing you um a disservice more than it was a um, an improvement on your self-esteem? I was working in a program at the time that I was also going through a divorce. And in this program, there were women from all different walks of life. I'm talking Ivy League educated to recently incarcerated. And they had all gathered for this program in which they were ultimately learning social etiquettes, maybe financial wellness, like relational health and wellness. And one thing that I learned when I was in this program, I was actually working for the program. I wasn't a part of it, is that like all of these women, no matter what their backgrounds were, had this vulnerability where they were willing to say, this is where the area where I need improvement. And it taught me that as a teen mom, I thought I was the only one who had an area of growth that I needed to work on. It taught me that like every woman is working on something. And if every woman is working on something, then maybe we would do better if we collaborated instead of competed. And the reality is sometimes a woman is working in an area that I've mastered or she's working through something that I already have the cheat code for. And so when we come together, we have an opportunity to boost one another up. And they boosted me up while I was working the program, just doing the logistics and administrative side of it. They were allowing me access by just viewing their story to take an inventory of my own story and then to see how I needed to grow and improve. And so I attribute that flip in mindset to the power of vulnerability, which is why as awkward as it is to be vulnerable in front of a world full of people who have you know, no idea who I am at my core, I am committed to vulnerability because if it makes just one person feel less alone, then maybe that one person will also grow because mm. they realize that they're not in any situation by themselves. Mm. And you say that one of our biggest villains is our, if we are inauthentic. Oh yeah. Yeah, and authenticity is a villain because it cheats you from being you and it cheats the world from experiencing you. Mm. And it's so easy to fall into inauthenticity because we would rather be received, accepted. It's so much easier to conform. And so we become whoever we need to be in order to achieve that acceptance, that sense of belonging. And yet we are still unfulfilled because we feel like these people don't really know who I am. If they really knew who I were, then they'd actually leave me alone. Instead of being authentic and saying, maybe I don't have 10 friends anymore. But me and this one friend, we ride until the wheels fall off and then we walk in. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have such richer, deeper connections when you allow yourself to be authentically who you are, as opposed to having a wide, shallow pool of friends mm -hmm. and connections based off of who you're pretending to be. And so the more that we are willing to be authentic, not just in our friendships, in our marriages, and our places of work, the better off we are in making sure that we create a space that makes room for us. I have an analogy in the book where it's like, we are not creating space for ourselves in the very world that we are responsible for facilitating. 
And we have to be willing to make space for ourselves in our world by bringing all of who we are. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, you know what, when you said that, there was something about your tone that made me feel like you were actually disregarding what I said. And I just want to see, do we have an issue? Is there something we need to know? Like, I have to give voice to what's happening to me. And it doesn't mean, once again, that I have to burn the office down or that I have to burn bridges. But I have to let you know where my boundary is, how something you did affected me. And the people who I am in relationship with adjust based off of that. And because they adjust, we have trust because I know I can bring all of who I am and you have the ability to accommodate that truth. So talking about when you find yourself in those moments of, of inf- inauthenticness and other people, and so you start to like learn, okay, I'm going to be more authentic today. That change, going back to something we said earlier, can be difficult because other people who don't want to change and now saying almost like your evolution is a problem. Yeah. It's like, oh, look, you've changed. Mm-hmm. So how do you start to break free of that if you started off from a place of inauthenticity? Inauthenticity? I know, right? It's, like, like, it's a tongue twister. We just made it one <laughs> on Women of Impact. It's a word now. <laughs> a word now. Uh, first of all, I think the worst thing we can do is like send out this blanket press statement. Like, FYI, I have been pretending to be someone I am not. <laughs> and from this point forward, you all will meet the new and improve me. It, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. It's strange. People don't know what it means. I think that you begin to live authentically. And so I used to have this thing where I would like maybe, well, I'm not an extrovert. When I walk into the room as much stage presence as I may have when I'm speaking when I walk into the room I could like fold into the wall and I would be so cozy there it'd be amazing but I had this thing when I at first be you know I guess I became kind of popular where I expected that when I walked into the room I had to be the way that people would expect me to be and so I try to be like the life of the party and like here I am and I'm so happy to be here and all of these things and I just got so tired of pretending to be that that I was like I'm gonna walk into the room I'm going to let the room adjust to where I am. And in doing that, you know, maybe someone would be like, are you feeling okay? I'm like, no, I'm feeling fine. I'm just kind of chill today. Like, just tell your truth. You know, maybe I, I maybe I could do these things in the past, but today I, I'm not up to it. The more that you begin to introduce your truth, you don't have to have a blanket statement. It doesn't require you to find a new group of friends where you can start over. You know, why aren't you laughing at that? You used to think it was funny. I actually think it's a little hurtful. I kind of feel sorry for her because she's mm-hmm. going through this. Like, to begin to tell the truth. And maybe they say, you know what? You're acting funny. And they say, we'll never bring that up again. Good for you. You created a boundary that let them know that these types of conversations aren't going to be beneficial if you want to have them with me. Or maybe they say, you know what? I never thought about it that way. I I bet she is going through a hard time. I wonder what we can do to help her. You never know if you're going to be the catalyst that invites other people to experience change as long as you are being inauthentic or committed to who you used to be instead of stepping into who you actually are. That's so amazing. And would the first step be to understand your own values because you talk about in your book there are two main values and if you don't actually mind talking us through that so that people at home if they may not even realize well okay I want to be authentic but I just don't know how yeah it does it definitely comes down I've said a few times throughout this like who do you want to be yeah and what I'm basically saying are like what are your core values what essence do you want to leave in the rooms that you are in the relationships that you're in, the positions that you are holding, what essence do you want to leave in those rooms? I can't determine what those are for you. I can tell you that some of mine are are kindness. I can tell you that some of mine are connection. Some of mine are relatability. And because those are a Mm -hmm. part of my core values, I want to believe that whoever experiences me gets a version of those things, whether it is a business meeting in which we're talking about strategy and how to plan something for longevity, or it's just me and my children talking. I want to believe that that is what they experience. And so those are my core values for who I am as a person. And then we have to determine like, what are my core values for this friendship? So in this friendship, what is it that I want to be a part of our values? I want us to support one another. I want us to be honest with one another. I want us to be able to have loyalty amongst one another. Mm -hmm. And when you have those values, you then get to ask yourself, how are my actions? How are my words aligning with those values? And if there is a disconnect, you have to choose to live by those values values and determine whether or not that friendship can survive with those values in place. And if they can't, 
that may not be the friendship for you. Mm -hmm. But there is a possibility that those values rise the quality of that friendship to being something that is more aligned with who you know you are supposed to be. How did you start to do that where you were blocking out what people were saying so that you could really hear your own voice? So when I first started speaking and people would tell me like, oh my gosh, that was so powerful, you're a powerhouse, it was, it was freaking me out oh. because <laughs> like, I was just I was just out there sharing what God gave me. Mm -hmm. I was just telling my story. I was just trying to reach people who may need to hear things communicated in the way that I need to hear them communicated. Mm -hmm. I didn't go out seeking to be powerful. And so I really started like praying like what is it that they're seeing that doesn't resonate with who I think that I am? And what I learned is that they were experiencing the overflow of who I was when no one was looking. And so I had to be careful when I started getting that validation because I'm a teen mom and because I experienced a lot of rejection and a lot of abandonment issues, there was a part of me that was like, oh my gosh, it finally feels good to be accepted and received and loved and adored. But it also didn't feel safe because I know what it's like to have like a blanket ripped off of you and said, well, you don't deserve it anymore. So I found myself in this balancing act of, I want to believe it. I want to enjoy it, but I also don't want to lose it. So I kind of shut it off altogether. Mm -hmm. And I started seeking a power that was not contingent on performance, a power that only relied on me being authentic to who I am, taking care of the things that I value and allowing that to just be the moment where I step into another form of authenticity. And so, um, you know, I am blown away by who I've been able to be in serving other people's lives but I don't feel I'm defined by it. Mm. And I also feel like who they get whenever I'm speaking and sharing is the same person that my children and my family experience. So there is no separation. So it doesn't take me by surprise who I am in those moments anymore because I see it as the full expression of who I am, whether someone's looking or not. Mm. That overflow thing is so true. And I think more and more women need to really do that and hear that because then you don't feel depleted yeah. after you're serving other people. And so thinking through the idea that you're, um, you're really fueling your, your own soul first before you can really help others is so powerful. Um, and then the overflow thing, because I think the, I'm thinking about guilt, right? Where yeah. I'm thinking about, especially mothers, where it's like, well, I have to show up for my kids and I have to show up for my kids. And what you end up doing is you deplete yourself. Yeah. And so then as you deplete yourself, you do feel powerless. You don't necessarily feel in control. And so is that what you were doing with your kids then is making sure that you kept fueling yourself so that your kids would end up feeling the beauty of of you doing that self-care work? Yeah, you know, I also didn't want to perform for them. And so mm -hmm. if I came home from work and I was super tired and they were trying to get my attention and I needed to close one thing out, one of two things would happen. I'd like close my laptop, pretend I didn't have to work, try and show up for them, but be tired, be distracted, be resentful because I knew I had some things to do. Or I would say, you know what, mommy needs 10 minutes to finish mm -hmm. what I'm doing here so that I can give you my undivided attention. I stopped treating my life like I didn't have any options, like they were incapable of understanding. I started asking for support. There were some, I think, just roles that I thought were exclusively a part of my role as a mother. And so I wouldn't ask my husband to do anything to help me in certain areas because I felt like you're the mom, this is what you're supposed to do. But I'm a person, I am a mother, but I'm a person. And so I started saying, hey honey, can you distract the girls for 15 minutes so that I can sit in the car and do 10 minutes of breathing exercises mm -hmm. and five minutes of TikTok strolling, <laughs> scrolling <laughs> before I come into the house. And the more that I did that, the more that it created space for them to see me as a person, mm -hmm. not just their genie who knows how to make their favorite sandwich <laughs> or doing whatever they needed. And now sometimes it was so funny. I lost my keys the other day and I was starting to get a little panicked because we were late and my daughter was like, mom, wait, take a minute, calm down. Aww. She's eight. <laughs> She's like, calm down. But she doesn't see me as this. I, I mean, I think she sees me a little bit as a superhero, but she sees me as her mom and a woman who sometimes gets frustrated, who gets tired, who gets stressed. And so I don't feel like I'm disappointing her by being human. And I help her to see like, you know how you were tired after you did soccer mm. and after you went to school. Now mommy's tired because I had a big day of meetings. We're going to have a low key dinner and then we're just going to sit back on the couch and chill. I introduce 
the fullness of who I am and everything that I do so that there is space for two people to be in this relationship, not just the child, but the child and the mother, not just my husband, but me and my husband, not just the business owner, but me and my team. And so the more that I can bring all of myself, the full expression, Mm -hmm. not just the highlights, the more I have found that it's easier to not be so easily depleted or taken advantage of. Wow, that's amazing. And I mean, you're doing multiple things there. First of all, you're... uh, reaffirming to yourself that you're worth it. You're worth the time and energy that it takes to really go inside yourself and, you know, do the self-care. Number two, you're really talking to your daughter and you're showing her all the power moves that we were never taught growing up. Oh my goodness. I want her to be able to say that when she's a woman that, and she's having a breakdown or she's nervous about something, that there's nothing wrong with her. Mm Because mommy used to get nervous too. Sometimes I'll be about to speak and I'm like, I need you guys to say a prayer for mommy. Mommy's nervous. I hope my notes make sense. I studied a lot. Like they see me studying. They see me nervous Mm -hmm. and they see me moving in power too. I want them to have the full picture so that when life is helping them figure out what their storyline is going to be, that they're not taken by surprise when their humanity shows up. I don't want to be their um, figure of perfection. I want to be someone that is relatable to them because I know they're going to draw from what has been modeled in front of them when it's time for them to step into whatever life has for them. Mm. And being that model, I think is so powerful. I mean, there's one video actually that you released on your Instagram and it's stuck with me to this day, girl. It's when you're on stage and you're preaching and you're just in the zone, like you are channeling and you just rip off your wig because it's getting in your way. (laughs) When I say I watched that video over and over and over, I was like, oh my God, this is so good. This is so good. Because it just showed me that all the things that we think you said this earlier, that make us powerful. How do we look? How do we sound? Do we seem authoritative? You know, like all these things that we perceive to be, actually the power is in not caring about any of that and really just being yourself. And that yeah. video where you <laughs> rip off your wig and you're like, I don't care, it's getting in my way. <laughs> like, it, was, it was, again, a beautiful example for anybody watching to be like, now what? Like, yeah. do you perceive this as powerful? And the answer guaranteed is going to be yes, but yet we don't do it in ourselves. Yeah. So what other things do you feel very important right now to be able to show your daughter um, so that she can gain the power young so that she doesn't have to feel powerless as an adult? Mm, body image. Uh, I'm trying to teach her about embracing her body, what true confidence is. I'm trying to teach her about her bodily autonomy as well. Uh, Mm. One of my daughters, she's 14 years old and she's beginning to see like how she shows up in the world and the effect that it can have on other people, teenage boys in particular. (laughs) And I'm teaching her to protect that, to not be moved by it, to not allow that to be the thing that makes her feel confident. Mm. Uh, Because it's so easy to do that, especially when everything in music and culture is celebrating the admiration of your body, but you are so beautiful on the inside. You have so much intellect and intelligence. And if you don't value that and you put yourself on discount to instead value what they value in you, then they're going to miss out on the best parts of you. And so we're talking about body image. We're talking about spirituality. I'm trying to be very careful about making sure that though they have baby dolls and they have a house that they're also thinking about like, but what, what else may you want to offer into the world? Mm. Because I, who knows with the way that so many women have been reduced to thinking, if I can't have children, if I don't get married, then I have no value at all. I don't know what the future holds for them. And so I want them to know that they have a broad broad opportunity to add value to the world outside of bearing children and being married. You have an incredible mind. How do you want to use it? Let's write stories. Let's do fashion design. Let's go get fabric. Let's cook sometimes. Let's try different dishes. Like I want to make sure that they have a full tour of what it means to be a woman in all of her expressions. And so we're reading a lot of books and, um, I'm also making sure that they have a lot of great conversations with their father because I don't want the first time for them to hear uh, from a man's perspective it being a man that they're trying to pursue romantic relationships Mm. with. And so making sure that they leverage that access to what's available in their world and fully use it before we put them out into the world without us has been, you know, my prayer, (laughs) my prayer and my desire for them. Wow. And how much of that have... 
I assume a lot, but you've had to do the work yourself because you can't teach if you're not there yourself. Oh goodness, I'm I'm still doing the work. Mm. I'm in correcting their lesson plans as I learn oh. new things. You know, like you know how mommy said this last week. Well, one of the things that I learned this week, and what do you think about that? I'm creating a space where I'm hearing their thoughts as well, and so I'm hoping that when they grow older and they reflect on their childhood, that they don't just hear my voice in the conversation, but they hear mm. a conversation that was taking place that I took the time to understand where they were coming from. I think that's really important too, especially as parents, we can get so caught up making sure that we just deposit the lessons that we don't take the time to make sure that they're hearing it properly or to understand where they are to make sure that we didn't skip a few lessons. I don't know if you've ever, well, you probably remember skipping a few days of class and you get in a class and they're talking about mm. something that you missed the lesson for. And sometimes we're teaching them lessons, but we haven't done the work to see, wait, where are you now? So that I can make sure that this lesson is actually appropriate for where you are. Maybe I'm talking about confidence and what we really need to talk about is uh, your anxiety. Maybe we really need to talk about you feeling like you need to be perfect. And so making sure that I have an appropriate lesson for their developmental stage, emotionally and mentally and spiritually is really important to me too. So creating that space, asking those questions is a part of what I'm doing. Wow. I mean, as adults, we need to do that. Like, where are you now? Yeah, I wasn't raised like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents very much so did a phenomenal job of creating a space where we felt loved and cared for. But, you know, I think the wave of gentle parenting and listening and asking questions is relatively new, mm -hmm. but it has been very helpful for me in advocating for my voice, my needs and my wants. And it's hard. It's so hard to advocate for what you want to so forget advocating. It's difficult to identify it which is part of the reason why in the book, I want to be able to help people identify what you want. You know what you don't want, but can you tell me what you do want? What do you want to feel? What do you want to do? Who do you want to become? If we can identify what you want, then we can begin to advocate for that. And so giving people the language in this space to identify, advocate, and then begin to ask for that in the spaces that matter the most, it does require work, but it's some of the work that I really believe has changed my life. Wow, and I love that you said, how do you want to feel? Because so many of us, when we say, what do we want? It's usually like the rest Resume, right? Yeah. It's like, well, I want to be this and I want to be married and I want this title and I want this career and I want to get the picket, you know, the white picket fence. But the feeling of it, yeah. that brings you internally. Is that what that does? For sure it does. And I think it helps you to determine whether or not what you want and what you, and what you want to feel actually align. So mm -hmm. like, I want to have a small waistline. <laughs> <laughs> I want to feel happy when I eat. Salad does not make me want to feel happy. <laughs> you mean you don't love the lettuce? I have to be honest, the, the lettuce doesn't do it. And so that is why what I want is out of reach because what I want to feel is more important to me. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is most important, what you want, or what you want to feel. And to be honest, mm -hmm. on some days, the answers are different. What I want to feel is more important than this waistline today. Mm -hmm. But long term, to be able to say, okay, but what I want may require that I give up on what I want to feel because they may not always align. But being able to acknowledge both, both of those things, that's how we live in our truth. It doesn't mean that our truth defines our path, but allowing us to live in our truth then helps us to make the type of choices based off of long-term where we want to head. Oh my God, that's so good. So how do you make sure that, that you don't like nudge too much in the other way? Because let's say you want a, you know, a small waistline. Ice cream tastes freaking good. It does. So in that moment where let's say your hormones are acting up, you're tired, you've you know been there for the kids, you've been there for the husband, and you really want that freaking ice cream. Mm -hmm. But now it's like every day. Yeah. So how do you um, make sure that you decide the thing that actually ends up serving you long term and know the moments that actually right now having the ice cream will serve you long term because then you won't have the cravings that then leads you to binging. Okay, well then let's go. There's what I want. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's what I want to feel right now. Mm -hmm. And there's what I want to feel long term. Okay. 
And sometimes that what I want to feel right now is important. Okay, Mm -hmm. life has been stressful. The day has been dang and I need a little bit of a reprieve. But then you have to ask yourself is how am I going to feel later? And am I okay with that? What am I going to have to do to make up for this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And am I okay with that? Because I will say that what I want more than anything is as my body ages and as my children grow older, I want to feel strong. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel limber. And so that is my overarching desire. And so sometimes I work out when I'm tired. Sometimes I do eat the salad, even though it's not bringing me joy. But in those moments where I'm like, you know what? The French fries are all that matters. I give myself a little (laughs) bit of space there. I just, when they start mattering every single day, I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. now, wait a minute. (laughs) What's happening inside of you? What's happening in your world where you need this escape every single day? Mm -hmm. Are you stressed? Are you tired? Have you signed up for too many things? And what do you need to eliminate so that you're not constantly putting yourself at jeopardy? And we're talking about food, right? But this happens in bad relationships. This happens in us overworking ourselves. This happens in us serving everyone else and not serving ourselves because we want to feel desired. We want to feel wanted. We want to feel helpful. But we're also breaking ourselves down trying to do all of those things. And so being able to say, what do I want to feel long term? I want to feel in control of my life. I want to feel like I can say no without losing out on opportunities. And then we get to dissect what type of decisions are connected to me getting that long-term goal. Wow. I love the stepping stones of really acknowledging those three and then also asking yourself that, that question because we can make so many excuses. We can give ourselves all the reasons why no, no, I just need the French fries or, yeah. you know, but he loves me. So yeah. even though he is verbally abusive, he tells me he loves me. So, it, you know, let me just, um, you know, make the peace right now for then, you know, that future of like the possibility of we're going to be happy. But doing the three steps, I think really does take the blinders off. Yeah. All those things that we may give ourselves the excuse, whether it's the now or the future. Um, so how do you, let's actually talk about them relationships in this way. Okay. Because the love part, the heart is like the, the thing that can really lead us astray sometimes if we're not necessarily listening to it or treating it with respect. Mm-hmm. What you doing? Shopping for a new outfit? Yeah, I found all of these amazing stores online that I've never heard of before. Homie, you crazy? The internet is full of freaking threats. And if you let even your guard down for one second, it could be the end where you actually get freaking scammed. No, not really at all. I don't have to be afraid of scammers anymore thanks to Aura. What's Aura? Aura's powerful tools are designed to keep you safe from all types of cyber threats, from identity theft monitoring to real-time fraud prevention. Aura has everything you need to stay one step ahead. And I've got to go collect my badass top that just arrived in the mail, thank you. And you may need to think about some wearing something too. Aura, what's wrong with my outfit? It really feels like you've kind of got okay these are all the things that I care about and then these are the things almost in order of priority yeah because knowing what your core values are then allow you to have beautiful relationships but if you don't put it in that order then if you're just going from having a great relationship or looking to have a great relationship then you're like what what does that mean okay no fighting okay I'll I'll make myself small so you can kind of see how people if they don't do almost the values first for sure it doesn't allow you to be authentic, then to step in your own, then to command respect, then to set boundaries. That was the hardest part of writing the book because I knew I wanted to talk about core values, but I also wanted to talk about systems. And I'm like, do I do the systems first or the core values first? Because we do have these systems, like our friendships, our relationships, the way we show up in the world. It's a, it's the byproduct of a system, right? And so I always show up this way. When I show up this way, this is what happens. We get together. We talk about our other friend. We have a good laugh. Then we invite the other friend out to dinner. She has no idea we're talking about her. We leave. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that is a system. But does that system align with the type of values that you want to possess. If you have a different value, you need a new system. And so I wanted to walk people through the reality that you may have a value that is not showing up in your system. Mm -hmm. And so if you want your value to show up in your system, you have to be willing to let go of these systems and replace them with a different type of system. And so those values are very important for setting the foundation of how we engage with others, how we engage in our faith, how we engage with ourselves and being able to hold those 
those values true to our decision making. And it doesn't mean that we live up to it all of the time, right? Like I'm not going to gas anybody up. You're going to fail, right? But you're going to know it's a failure. Mm. You're going to know it's a failure. You're not just going to give yourself a pass. You're not just going to say, okay, this is who I am. You're going to feel convicted for not living up to the values of who you want to be. And that level of conviction and remorse allows you to show up differently next mm. time. I love that. And that's the thing, the key is that it becomes like a cheat sheet. Yeah. So that in the moments where you may feel emotional or someone's triggering you oh, yeah. or you're in a heated debate and you're just like, maybe I just agree with them just to like, right. you know, soften the, the, the blow or this argument. It allows you to not be steered by those things. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't want to be steered by emotions when they don't serve the higher version of myself. Yeah. And I can, like, I can very much allow my emotions to take me um, aside and, you know, lead me somewhere astray, I should say. And so I, because I'm aware of that, I need all of my cheat sheets to be able to go back to. So having a value system that you can keep going back to allows yourself to say, okay, I want to people please right now because I know it's going to make them feel better. It's going to make me feel better. (laughs) But it doesn't stay true to my value system. Yeah. This happened to me the other day. So my son is 21 years old. We were supposed to go on an apartment tour. He's moving out of the place that he's living in now. And my head was hurting. And he'd waited almost a week for me to do this Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to tell him no but my head was hurting and I was like I could just truck through and I could go up there and I could get it over with but my head was hurting and I texted him I was like baby I'm so sorry can we see if they can do tomorrow instead my head hurts and he's like oh my gosh mom I'm of course absolutely do you need anything and I was just thinking that if I would have just shown up anyway with my head hurting I would have probably been cranky not the best person for Mm -hmm. the job and then ultimately I would have robbed him from seeing like hey mom doesn't always have all of the strength in the world. She doesn't always, you know, show up in the way that I need her to show up because she's dealing with her own thing. And when she's dealing with her own thing, it's my opportunity to serve her as well. And a lot of times we're like, no one helps me. I'm the strong friend. Nobody does anything for me. How often are you asking someone to do something for you? How often are you showing up from a space of you are in need as opposed to the person who is fulfilling the need? Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to create a version of yourself that is seen as someone who was not just here to serve and do things for other people, but someone who was here to say, you know what, I have a need too. And people who have the ability to fulfill that need are often very willing to do it if you just tell them that it exists. And if you hadn't done all of that work, I bet you any money you would have been like, I can't, I can't do that. I'm a bad mother if I don't go with him. For sure. The story you tell yourself. And then like, it's not just I'm a bad mother for not going. I already had him at 14 years old. Now I can't show up for the apartment tour because it just spirals into Mm. like all of these ways that I've already failed and I don't want to fail again. But once again, that's a fear driven decision. Here's the reality. He doesn't move for like three months. He's super proactive. Like his lease isn't up for three months. So like I'm not killing him by saying, can we wait a week, you know? And he was so gracious. He's like, do you want me to come take care of you? And I would have missed out on seeing that, like, I do have support if I would have just continued to show up and and been strong. And it allows the other people around you to show up for you. If you're always showing up for them, people want to feel useful. They do, you know? So I wanted to make sure that I did not end the book without talking about the reality that we are a force amongst other forces. Mm. And sometimes those forces are hard and negative and we have to figure out how to navigate those. But sometimes those forces are forces in the making that we don't get to experience because we're always showing up in our strength instead of falling back so that we can experience their strength. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what I have learned in my friendships and my marriage and my organization that I have often robbed people of showing up in power because I thought that my power was more adequate or sufficient for the task at hand. And I have burnt myself out trying to show up in power 24-7 instead of choosing to power down so someone else could power up. And what I learned is when they power up that things still get done. Maybe it's not done in the same way that I got it done. Like my husband, he takes the kids to school. He orders them an amazing breakfast. I make them breakfast. Their stomachs are full and they are at school before the bell rings. I cannot be married to this idea. It needs to be home cooked. (laughs) It needs to be made from scratch. You know, they need to have these clothes on. Like I cannot hold him 
hostage to my version of what it looks like to show up in this space. And I miss out on the opportunity of seeing his expression. And they, they give him much less of a hard time than they give me. And so it also helped me to see like they can do things quickly, mm -hmm. they just choose not to. Mm -hmm. And so there is something very incredible about powering down so other people can power up. I love that. And going back to something you were saying earlier, it's like the expectation now, it's just like your husband can do his thing. You know that the kids are just gonna be taken care of, but you're not actually making him feel, like you were saying about how um, we, we can be toxic back. Yeah. And so let's face it, that would have been somewhat of a toxic behavior because we're sitting here saying, you know, don't don't hold to other people's expectations. Do you? What is your authenticity? And now actually you're putting your own expectations on your husband and expecting him to do it when we don't want to do what other people <laughs> expect of us. For sure. One of the chapters I am most proud of is Know Your Harm. And it all centers around knowing the ways that you are harmful. Because I know that we live in a generation where we have haters and everyone else is the bad guy and we're always the victim and we have to overcome what people have done to us. But here's the reality is that we have all been the villain in someone's story. And if you don't know the way that you can be harmful, that you get tired and you get mean, that you get get stressed and you start getting lazy. Like if you don't take into account the ways that you lack empathy, the ways that you think everyone else should just have to survive because you had to survive and no one gave you a hand up. If you don't realize the way that you show up in a harmful way, then you do not know how your ability to engage with other people can be harmful or helpful. You got to know that you're going to do some things that are harmful. And when you can own that without making you feel like a bad person or that you're just so negative, well, I'll just be by myself then. Mm -hmm. Then you get to show people that like, hey, I'm not going to do everything perfectly. But when I see that I've been harmful, you can also expect that I will change and I will make every effort to do things differently in the future. So power is not about perfection. It's about full ownership of your good and your bad, of your beautiful and your complicated. And that full ownership is what makes you a force. You're a force when you can say, I can fail and get back up again because failure doesn't define me. I can win without winning, making me arrogant because I recognize that I only won by the grace of God. Like I can move in power because I recognize the full expression of who I am. Yeah, God is so powerful. And when I first met you, you know, a few years ago now, I had the outside idea of who you were and then I meet you and you're sitting there telling me about all your stories about you know your ex that you drive up and you're screaming at him <laughs> and you're like once in the run the woman over yes. or whatever that he mm -hmm. was like cheating on you with like the, the stories and say, and you were just like yeah I was angry I was mad I was petty I wanted to do all this and that authenticity in owning how toxic you were oh, now yeah. look of course there's there's um the catalyst, which is his actions. Oh, no, I'm fine to own mine, yeah. But, yeah, but the fact that you owned it, yeah. um, I think becomes so powerful because now people aren't beating themselves up and living in the shame of the fact that they have done that in the past. And I think the second you potentially live in shame, hold something back, you think it means something about you, you can't then be authentic. Right, right, right. No, you can't. Uh, because you can't see yourself without the lens of the ways that you have shown up in the past. And I, I mean, that's why so much of this is an inside job is because a lot of times we're just holding ourselves hostage. We're saying, I can't do this because of this. And it's really about liberation. And when you are liberated, you have no choice but to be a force in the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will say that for a lot of people, the idea of being a force feels intimidating or sounds intimidating. Like there's more responsibility responsibility, more stress. It requires more stress and more responsibility to pretend to be someone than there is connected to you just being who you are. It doesn't mean that I don't always have, you know, day, my bad days or my days when I'm stressed, but I'm not living with this constant pressure to perform. God shows up when God shows up for me. I show up when I show up. We'll see what happens when I get there. I don't know where this conversation's going to go. I may stumble over my words. I may short circuit and say something I don't mean. I may have to apologize for that. Like I'm not living with this pressure to perform and be perfect. I've given my spa myself space to be human, to be compassionate with myself, and to make a better choice next time. And that is as much power as I think any of us are going to get. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Um, 
Can you do you mind taking me back to that moment? You shared the story before, but I would love for you to share it again because I've got a follow up question. So this is when you your ex is with or you're dating him, mm-hmm. and there's a woman over. Okay, we were actually married, and so, there was I was you know cooking and trying to perform again. Like I'm cooking this dinner. The marriage wasn't good. It, we never really had a really solid space, but I'm still like, I will pretend my way through this, block my eyes out and just keep it trucking. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to create this white picket fence dinner of the moment. And I think he was sitting down with the kids and I looked and I realized his car wasn't outside where it was usually parked. I kind of like peeked out the window discreetly and I saw the car was running uh, a th- about a block down the road. And so I like creeped outside while they were eating. I walk up to the car there's a woman in the car. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, we're kicking it. I was like, what are you doing with my husband? She said, we're kicking it. And I was like, kicking it? Excuse me? And so I go back to my house and I hop into my car and I just start ramming the car over and over again. By then, my ex-husband at the time, he comes outside. He's like, oh my gosh. He hops in the car. He's trying to drive off. I block the car. They call the police on me. The officer comes up to me. He's like, what seems to be the problem here, ma'am? I'm like, well, my husband brought his girlfriend to the house. I had a problem with that. He was like, I see how that could be an issue. I'm going to go talk to them. And I was like, go talk to them. And um, he was like, I am not going to arrest you. I'm going to write you a ticket, though. Um, You're going to have to go see CPS because I need to make sure that the children are in a safe environment. And I'm going to let this go. It'll be on them whether or not they press charges. (sighs) Okay. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. I've got a follow-up question now. Okay. If you could go back... So you sitting here in your power, having done all the power moves, if you could go back to that Sarah who felt powerless, how would, what advice would you give her and what would you do differently? Oh, I would have still ran the cars. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love that. I did I not expect you, that answer. I, pro- <laughs> I, pro- I expected a really like, well, I would do Oh that. no, I would have. <laughs> but actually, so let me know. Let me tell yeah, you why. Please, please. Because... Um, I mean, sure, you know, I love God, I'm a Christian, all of these things, but I think it taught me that I could really lose it in a way that would make me lose my children and end up in prison. Like, I Mm -hmm. did not know how quick it is for you to lose yourself. I just, I wouldn't change anything about that moment. Like I, one of the things that our teams at Woman Evolve are constantly working on ways that we can serve women who are experiencing incarceration because I really feel like I was one, literally one more situation from being in prison. Cause I was like, there was nothing you could do to stop me. And it is literally by the grace of God that nobody ended up injured or hurt because at that moment it was anything could happen. And so it taught me what was in me, how toxic it was, how bad it was, how black it was inside of me. And I don't know that I would change that. Okay, so let's assume, so the lesson of it was so powerful that you wouldn't change it. Yeah. Let's say you learn the lesson, going back to that moment, what would you have told yourself? Assuming that you would learn the lesson anyway. Take us through them building that power in that moment where we can really lose our shit and be completely powerless. I would say that it is okay for this to fail. I was so afraid of experiencing another failure, another mark on my reputation, Mm -hmm. that I felt like I have to fight for this, like it's life or death. And I think that I would say to myself in that moment, that your pride is keeping you from truly seeing that this is never going to work, that it's like literally never going to work. And until you accept that this is never going to work, then you're never going to meet the version of you that does work. Like this is divinely a mess. Like there are some things that are just divinely a mess. Like this is not meant to work. And so it is always going to fall apart. Like it's not just the cheating. It's not just that you're away from home. Like this is not meant to work. And if you can accept that this is not meant to work, you can then figure out how do I make myself work outside of this relationship, Mm -hmm. outside of this job, outside of this experience? How do I focus on making myself work. I think I needed something to distract me. 
from what wasn't working inside of me. When I got pregnant at 13, I just felt broken forever. Like, I grew up in purity culture. Like, there were so many different layers to what it meant to be pregnant as a teenager, as a pastor's daughter, as the pastor's yeah, daughter. Say, the, <laughs> yeah, there were so many layers to, like, why this has damaged me forever. And what I know now is, like, restoration is real. And restoration is not always that my life goes back to looking like what it was before this happened. Mm -hmm. Restoration is when my spirit returns to what it was before this happened. Sometimes we sell people on restoration and they're like, I'm never going to get the time back. I'm never going to get the kid back. Like, there's no way this can be restored. Restoration isn't about getting the things or the people back or the life back that you once had. Restoration is about getting your soul back mm -hmm. to a place of hope of joy, of love, of kindness. And I needed restoration that had nothing to do with pretending I didn't have a child or trying to pretend that I had this perfect picture little life. I needed the kind of restoration that says this 13 year old girl who got pregnant, who dropped out of college, who waitressed at this strip club, found joy. She found peace, she found confidence, she found power. Her soul has been restored. And what I believe women need more than anything is not necessarily to have this multi-million, billion-dollar business. It's not to have this perfect Prince Charming or the right friends or to travel the world because you can have all of those things and still have a broken soul. What we need more than anything is to get to a place where our soul has been restored. And mm -hmm. from that place of spirit, spirit restoration, everything else flows. We find peace in what we do have. We still can imagine what things could be like and then sometimes take the steps to actually walk into that, but it doesn't happen with pressure because our spirit, we have a spirit for what is around us and for what is behind us and for what is possible mm. for us as well. Wow, I love the idea of the restoration. That's so beautiful. How do you make sure that because you even said what's behind us. How do we make sure that sometimes we don't carry all the things that are behind us into our future when they don't serve us? I love that you said when they don't serve us because I very much so carry all of who I am into where I am. Mm -hmm. Like, had I not ran them cards, like my husband, my amazing husband, he like knows I'm crazy. He's like, don't push your buttons. <laughs> Because I carried some of that crazy mm. with me. but um, And the, when you say crazy, you mean like a trigger? The trigger, yeah. the trigger, yes. Um, but how do we get to a space where we're able to, to let go of what no longer serves us? Mm. It comes down to compassion. I had to find a way to have compassion, not anger, for who I once was. So it used to be when I thought about getting pregnant at 13 years old, that I was like, you're nasty, you're dirty, like you're such a bad girl, no one's ever gonna want you. Like, how could you be so dumb? Like you just, it just all of these negative thoughts. But when I started to look at that girl through a lens of compassion, I recognized that I was lonely, I was afraid, mm -hmm. I was isolated. In some moments, I was really angry at how quickly my parents' ministry had grown and how I felt lost in the midst of it. I didn't have a relationship with God, so I didn't feel like I was one of the girls who got it. And so there was a lot of desire, a lot of anger built up in my body at 13 years old. And so I could choose to carry the shame of that moment, the embarrassment of that moment, or the reality that when I feel isolated, when I feel rejected, when I feel alone, that I am willing to do anything to satisfy the pain that is within me. And because I carry that lesson that I learned through compassion with me, it helps me to be compassionate with myself when mm -hmm. I'm beginning to feel isolated, rejected, abandoned, alone as a 35 year old woman. And so I believe it really comes down to understanding the most powerful narrative, not the most destructive one. So when you look back on your life and you see what you've gone through, if there are only two buckets for your narrative and one gives you power and one further destroys you, 
You have to choose what bucket you're going to see your story through. And it is most powerful when we choose to see it through the bucket that requires compassion, empathy, forgiveness, as opposed to the one that requires us to constantly destroy that version of who we are so that we feel good about where we are now. One of the things I wrote in the book, people always say, the only person I'm better than is the person I was yesterday. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes there, I was better yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that was a better version of who I am because today I'm struggling and I'm okay with that because I recognize that life is a journey. I don't want to have to destroy who I was yesterday to build who I am today. I want to believe that I can embrace all of who I am because I need all of who I am to really affect what is in front of me today. And I'm here to cause and affect something in the earth. God, that was so short. When I read that in your book, I was like, oh my, because like, I love those shift moments, those yeah. moments where I think one way and then something shifts inside me and like doors open mm. and, you know, like the angels start singing. <laughs> um, and when I read that, I actually found that super powerful because I was the person that was always like, well, as long as I'm better today and not realizing because language matters. Yeah. The words you use, the, um, the phrases you're saying to yourself matter. It, it absolutely impacts how you show up the next day. I think of it as like water dripping on the stone. It eventually starts to take its shape. Yeah. And so if the word is a toxic word or if your idea of who you used to be becomes toxic, that dripping on you over time, the shape of your belief of who you are starts to change. So that idea of hang on a minute, but today you may be tired and now you're yeah. going to beat yourself up emotionally, judge yourself for it instead of saying, no, it's actually okay. Yesterday I was better. Dude, it freaking hit me for six when you you said that. So <laughs> I really love that idea because I look at the moments of that are holding us back. Yeah. And I think that it can be powerful in a way because I used to use it as a way to not compare myself to other people. Mm -hmm. So that was why I started to use it because I'm like, instead of comparing yourself to that person who's got 10 years ahead of you, yeah. you know, they've already been doing it for so many years. Why would you think you would be as good as them right. if you haven't practiced as much as them? So I would then shift my mindset to say, okay, how did you show up? Yeah. So it was empowering to go from that negative to the positive, but now there's this new evolution to this idea, which is stop even judging the self, the version of you yesterday, because maybe you are struggling with something today yeah. that you didn't. And if I can figure out why can't I show up mm. the way that I was yesterday in my most powerful form, what happened along the way? Maybe I'm carrying it. Maybe it was negative. Maybe I haven't processed it. Maybe me showing up today is rest. Maybe I need to change my definition of power for today. Yesterday, power was me boxing and working out and taking 18 business meetings. Today's power is in me resting. And if I'm constantly comparing who I was yesterday to who I am today, then I don't get to ask myself, but what do you need today? Mm -hmm. Because what you need today and what you can do today is how we will define power for today. Today. And then we'll ask the next question for tomorrow. But I don't want to be I don't want to be held hostage to who other people think I need to be or who I was yesterday. I want to live present in this moment and to be at one within myself in a way that allows me to bring all of the we're talking about power to bring all of my power into what is in front of me. Mm, and as I was thinking before we started rolling, we were talking about our age and I was telling you about my hormones yeah. and things like that. And now I think about even that. It's like in your 40s and 50s, you're not going to be the same as you were in your 20s. So if you're comparing your earlier self to now, well, maybe you are struggling more. Maybe your hormones are all out of whack. Absolutely. There are any number of things that keep us from being able to be who we were yesterday. And the only reason why I wanted to poke holes in that is because when you think about it too much in that way, you begin to feel discouraged because at a certain point yesterday was last year. You know what yeah. I mean? That was six years ago. And then you start to grieve this idea that maybe my better days are behind me. Maybe I'll never be able to access that version of who I am. Not allowing that version of who you were to, to just be released so that you can figure out what's possible for today. And then when you see what's possible for today, you're like, hey, you know, there are all of these different variables that I didn't have then. And now that I have them, I have to define what does success look like now because it may not be able to be what it was then. Yeah, God, that's so powerful. Okay, so talking about poking holes, you also talk about power leaks. Yes. So if you don't mind, um, Len, what are the power leaks that we can start to watch out for? Because as you're starting to build your power, your confidence, your self-worth, We've got to make sure that we're not then leaking in places that we may not even realize. Mm, uh, there, there are paper cuts, right? We, there's a saying, death by a thousand paper mm -hmm. cuts. And so most of us 
think about the moments when we've lost power, like maybe there was a big breakup, there was a loss, a transition, and we're like, these are those big power loss moments. But the reality is that there are small ways that we give ourselves, give our power away without even realizing it. That may be spending too much time on social media. It could be little small things that we allow to pass in our relationships that ultimately become big things. Like anyone who's been in a relationship knows that there's this moment where like now we're having a blow up, not just because you left the dishes out, but because X, Y, and Z happened along the way that I never said anything about. Not realizing that had I said something in the beginning, that there could have been a course correction that wouldn't have allowed things to Mm -hmm. blow up into something so big. And so the more that we can patch those small holes along the way, the less like we are to experience power leaks. And so uh, I like people to, um, in the book, there's a practice where we're like, let's go throughout the day and think about those moments where a little bit of power leaked, where you felt yourself not able to be fully authentic or giving someone a pass when you really didn't want to. And listen, I'm not the person that's like, now we got to call out everybody (laughs) who does anything to us. But we do have to be willing to reconcile at the end of the day, okay, woof, that drained me a little bit more than I anticipated. Like, who that that costs a little bit much. Why do I need to reconcile that? Because I need to be able to ask myself, how do I restore what has been leaked away? Maybe I need to go up to bed a little bit earlier. Maybe I need to modify my day. But if we just allow these small power leaks to become a part of our day to day, sometimes we end up depleted and we don't even know why. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I feel the way that I feel. Nothing big has really happened. No, because lots of small things have become big mm-hmm. things that have now made you feel so small in a world where you were once okay taking up space. Mm, so things like you say yes when you really meant no. For sure. And it seems like it's small, but you say yes anyway. Uh, you do something that doesn't, you agree to something that doesn't necessarily align with your true beliefs. Mm-hmm. You um, allow people to push you in a direction that is not necessarily congruent with what you believe. You see something on social media that you internalize as something that is targeted towards you or something that makes you question your uh, ability to show up in the space that you're in. There are any number of things, right, that can play a role in that. You saw someone working out at the gym and they were doing such a better job than you and you've spent the day thinking that I should just fall off the train altogether. Like these are small power leaks and we catch them not necessarily by telling that person okay well I'm going to come to the gym at a different time I'm going to make sure that I stop the comparison that made me believe that I needed to look the way that they look like we got to be way be willing to engage with ourselves Mm -hmm. in those moments where power is leaking from us and when applicable being willing to have tough conversations with people so that they can also stop poking those holes as well Mm -hmm. I start thinking about you know like the the last straw that broke the camel's back right so many of us women would just take more on more on more on put the weight on like more on our shoulders and eventually it's like yes the pressure and the the weight on your shoulders will break you so I'm always thinking how do I make sure I don't get to that stage how do I spot it when the third straw has been put on right and so thinking through okay maybe doing an assessment of my day where were those moments of power leaves that I can then start to block them I think is such a beautiful way to then not have to do 10 years of work yeah because that can be overwhelming right when you've got 10 years of all these things that you've you know stacked up just doing it day by day and blocking those leaks I absolutely love um talk to me about the dark side to power I actually have a quote of yours you said power without accountability Mm. will always turn to abuse part of the reason why I believe women have been so kind of adverse to wanting to be powerful or wanting to even be in positions of power is because we've seen so many moments where people had power and they had arrogance and they had no accountability. And as a result of it, we don't want to become that. So we avoid power altogether. Mm -hmm. The dark side of power is when we are setting our own rules, setting our own standards without having any type of accountability. For me, of course, I have accountability in my relationships and my friendships, whether it's with my husband, or with my parents or siblings, there's a level of accountability there. And I exercise that accountability by asking the types of questions that give them permission to be honest with me about the way that I'm showing up. Um, Can you give me an example? 
Sure. Um, so I may ask my husband, when I said that, did it feel dishonoring? Like when I said that, did I have an attitude or I'm sorry, I've been really stressed today. So if I said something that made you feel like I wasn't being present or I wasn't paying attention when you were talking, you know, that's because X, Y, Z is happening. And then he may tell me, my husband, I will tell you, he doesn't need a lot of permission to tell me. <laughs> He's pretty vocal about the areas where it's like, hey, are you here? Are you listening? Mm -hmm. But there's something interesting when you ask your children that because power, my husband and I are there are, are equal within our power dynamic. But with my children, where there is an offset with the power dynamic or with my team, where there is a power mm -hmm. dynamic to be able to ask, like, hey, are you comfortable? Do you need anything? Is there something that I can do better allows for them to tell me that there is an opportunity for me to grow. But you never discover that if you aren't asking those types of questions. What do I miss? Do you think this is the best idea? Do you like the run of show that we've put together? Asking those questions instead of just being a tyrant with your power mm -hmm. is how we have accountability and humility while also maintaining the power that's been given to us. I'm obviously a woman of faith, and so prayer is really important to me. Mm -hmm. Being able to center myself and not just go to God with my list of things that I need him to do, but to experience God's presence and my life through his presence. So... Mm -hmm. Was I an image of God, a reflection of God in all that I did today? If God was standing in the room, as mm. I believe that he was, but sometimes I act like he's not, <laughs> would I be able to get into mm. heaven? Like, is my ticket going to scan? <laughs> <laughs> like, if he scanned my ticket right now, is your girl getting behind those gates? And sometimes the answer is a very strong no, oh, wow. you know? And so then I know in those moments that, like, I exercise the power that doesn't align with God's power mm. in my life. And I hold myself accountable to recognizing that my power is on loan. There's nothing that God has given me in my life that has not come by God's power. And so if I mishandle God's power, I don't ask God for more of it. Mm. <laughs> I shouldn't expect to receive more of it because I have mishandled and misused the power and influence God has given me. And so my goal is to get to a place where when my time on earth is done, where God's able to say to me, well done, my good and faithful servant, that you were good and faithful as it related to being a vessel of my power, mm. not just when people were looking, not just when cameras were on, but when you were working with people behind the scenes, when you were raising these children, when you were loving the people who I put in your circle of influence. And so we have to surrender and make ourselves open to that level of accountability. But that's how we can trust that power is ours to serve and not to control. Oh, my God. It's it's so powerful in thinking like that because... Mm you're always looking for that improvement, that moment of like, how do I get better instead of like, was I perfect? Was I, you know? And I think that that's a beautiful way to think because you're always thinking forward, how do I grow and how do I change? For me, it almost like feels like a big North Star for you. It's like, okay, anytime that I'm feeling lost, anytime something's happening, let me go here and ask God. And then if that's a good reflection, then I'll get, you know, the keys yeah. into, into the gates, as you will. Um, <laughs> for me, it's, how do I feel about myself at night when I'm by myself? Mm -hmm. Can I actually say I'm proud of you today, Lisa? Yeah. And if I can't say I'm proud of you today, Lisa, then I have to assess why. Why? And then I have to assess those moments of why. Is it an old belief or is it actually a current thing that I do need to change? Because mm. the old belief may be, well, you said no to this person and they were disappointed. And it's like, yeah, but I had to say no for my own self-care. And then I can go, okay, that was an old belief. So I can, you know, I'm actually proud of myself. Versus, you know what, you're a little disappointed dismissive of that person today and that's why I don't feel like I can yeah. completely be um be proud of myself right now it's like okay well you can just do better tomorrow what will you do differently tomorrow and I used to spiral that voice in my head of like oh my god here you are again I can't believe that you're no good I told you you shouldn't have done that blah 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 and so now I'm I'm that idea is actually breaking me down instead of allowing me to build. And I think you say in your book, um, for every breakthrough, you need the breakdown. Yeah, for sure. You know what I love about what you said about even if you were dismissive to someone, mm -hmm. like to me, true power is then being able to go to that person yesterday. And like, you know what? I think I may have been yeah. dismissive. I was in the middle of doing X, Y, and Z because it's one thing to hold yourself accountable and be like, okay, I won't do that again. But there's something else to be able to fix what you did yesterday. And to me, that is powerful because it teaches people that you can trust me 
with you, right? So in a marriage, oh my gosh, we can sometimes get so caught up in our rhythm that we're talking to one another. Like I may talk to him like he's one of my team members or Mm -hmm. one of the children and he may do the same, but it's not necessarily that that won't happen again. But what I can trust is that when it does happen, that you will recognize it, apologize for it and become more sensitive to it when there's a possibility of it happening again. I will say that I really believe my husband is like the master of that because, you know, if, if something happens and I'm like, you know, ooh, that was a little spicy, you know, and we're like in the neighborhood of spicy and he'd be like, was that a little spicy? I was like, no, it wasn't spicy. But thank you for asking because now you're sensitive mm. to something that I vocalized affected me in the past. And it's also putting you in a position like you're not perfect. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And when you can accept that you're not perfect, you're more willing to Mm -hmm. forgive and apologize and mess up. And this is not about getting a license to do whatever, because we're constantly, like I said, stretching for more. But when we have a breakdown in the stretch, we're able to own that and then try again. Mm -hmm. And that's important to the human experience. Mm -hmm. Why do you think women perceive power as, as a whole, just potentially like, um, bad, if you will, because I I love that you called your book Power Moves. I love that this entire interview is about how women gain their power. But there's a lot of women that perceive the word power as being negative. Well, I, I believe that's got a lot to do with the systems of patriarchy mm. that have made us believe that we will not handle power properly or that we are not deserving of power. We're too emotional. And so we have a negative connotation about how we handle power The problem with that, even biblically, right, and I know not everyone's a believer, is that when God created creation and he made man and woman, he gave them power. He gave them Mm -hmm. dominion and authority. It was never supposed to be this hierarchy. Sin entered the world and now there's this hierarchy and patriarchy. But God's original intention was for man and woman to both walk in power, to release that power, to be fruitful and multiply, Mm -hmm. to be co-laborers. And so we were supposed to hold power. Now Eve in the garden, she did some things. <laughs> and now there are mindsets that make us believe that we are better left seen and not heard. I am on a mission to help women understand that your power doesn't have to look like the power that has been celebrated mm-hmm. in cultures and industries in order for it to be as potent and effective in introducing change in the world. And so I believe that my own life is such a testament of that, especially I will say as a woman of faith, um, religion can be very male dominated when we talk Mm -hmm. about, you know, patriarchy and religion and to see a woman who is stepping into a role of leadership and authority in a space of faith. I think it gives women permission to not just be women of faith who have to sit in the background who aren't allowed to have certain speeches and aren't allowed to do certain things and say, you know what? I am absolutely a woman. I mean, in every sense of the word, I'm not pretending to be a man. I'm not trying to be someone I'm not. I am a full-blown woman up here with a wig falling off. (laughs) Okay? This is a woman up here. But I am also bringing a power that is completely different than what you may have seen from other men speakers. Not Mm. about comparison, it's about duality. And the beauty of duality is when we don't just experience one expression of power, but many expressions of specifically God's power showing up in the context of faith. But Mm. when we talk about corporate spaces and industry, there are just some perspectives that men in a boardroom alone cannot bring to the table. We need women, we need women of color because they have a different type of power (laughs) and we cannot change industries or meet consumers in our people who are connected to the work that we do where they are with just one view of what it means to have power. And so I am hoping that my conversation is not the only conversation about women in power, but that other women with their own unique powers are able to combine with men and women alike to have a more broad version of what it means for us to be powerful. Oh yeah, and look, you're leading by example, girl, seriously. Like being the woman on stage, when you're on stage, it's like you're you're just on fire. Like I feel (laughs) your power coming through my laptop when I'm watching you. And so being a woman of example, leaning into it, and by saying this isn't something you should shy away from, writing a book about power moves and how to actually lean into your power and gain your power when you feel powerless, 
is I think a massive first step in us women actually starting to own it. And then hopefully there can be that echo effect. But you are freaking leading by example, mm -hmm. being here today, sharing your wisdom and you know, your book is incredible. For anyone listening right now, where can they go and find more of you and buy your book? Oh goodness. Well, they can buy Power Moves, Ignite Your Confidence and Become a Force wherever books are sold. And they can find me on all the socials. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Facebook. We're doing all, I've got a YouTube channel. I've got a podcast and, uh, you know, Woman Evolve. That's my my baby, and we're having an annual event. Mm -hmm. uh, we did 40,000 women at Globe Life Field wow. last year, and so I'm excited about what happens when women come together and unite all of our power mm -hmm. with the intent of really changing the world and our lives for the better. If you want to learn the love lessons that you need in order to build a lasting relationship, then click here right now. So right now, you are single. And you say yeah. you're on the dating streets, if you will. <laughs> and you said in order to be Hilarious. a great data, yeah. you need to be in a great...